to record. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michaela Cleaver. I'm the SPS Programs Coordinator, and I am happy today to introduce you to Dr. Randy Tag from University of Colorado at Denver. Uh, he's a longtime friend of SPS um, and will be giving a talk about his SciStar program. So if you could all be um, very welcoming in the chat, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A feature. Uh, as a reminder, this is being recorded, so please be respectful. Um, and Randy, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Michaela. I really appreciate this opportunity. And um, I um, want to thank all of you who are tuning in and, and look forward to having a discussion with you. Um, I noticed, uh, just happened to see that um, one of my collaborators in this project, Keegan Karbach, has, has joined us. And, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge his participation in this uh, project. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, I uh, will get started um, with, uh, uh, let me just give sort of a, a preamble, which is that all of us have experienced uh, in the past year and a half, um, you know, an extraordinary situation, but one which has really brought into clear focus how important science is to human wel welfare. And, and, and in turn, I think we can see that physics uh, itself plays a key role uh, in dealing with various aspects of the pandemic and health and so on, but also in other areas like we, you know, the the uh, security and, and reliability of our infrastructure, like power grids and pipelines and so on, and uh, the resilience of communities to uh, wildfires and uh, and uh, uh, hurricanes. And just more generally, uh, you know, how we go about adapting to situations and using technology to carry on with our lives and hopefully enjoy, you know, our lives to the fullest. And, and at the same time, bring an equitable opportunity to other people you know, around the world to have the same um, ple pleasures and privileges. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. And um, I'm going to try to share screen now. And um, I'm going to go to my desktop and uh, go to the slide presentation and switch over to full slide view. So I trust now that you're seeing the slides. Looks good. OK, thank you. And so the title is Physics for Humans. And this slide that is the cover slide came from Microsoft's uh, PowerPoint library of slides. But it's wonderful slide, it shows this village, uh, you know, I don't know if this is in Provence, France, or it looks a little too green to be Napa Valley, but it's just this marvelous, you see what maybe vineyards or orchards in the foreground, and, uh, you know, a village or a town in the in the background, and, and maybe even power lines, and sort of emphasizes this unity of, of uh, science and technology with our natural environment and with human dwelling. And so um, that's our topic. And I think a, an idea here is that we're really fortunate in physics that we have this 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 uh, discipline that is twice beautiful. I've made up this diagram on the left that shows different disciplines in physics, like electro electromagnetism or atomic and molecular physics. And um, this is for uh, I made this up for our upper division lab, showing how I'm hoping that students will have a chance to do sort of a deep dive in each one of these areas as they go through the lab experience and just see how marvelous physics is in terms of giving deep insight into the universe. But the other thing about physics is that it really is a means to serve the needs of humans and to uh, uh, help maintain a, you know, a sustainable planet and, and an equitable uh, uh, you know, global population. So it's this latter aspect that I would really wanna talk about. And if you think about how do you imagine what science can do and what physics can do for humans, you can sort of break things down into a bunch of topics. And some of them clearly come to mind, like energy, um, air and water we take for granted, except uh, when you go to Mars, um, but maybe not so much for granted, uh, food, uh, and so on. Um, then we might get over, you know, right now, uh, information science, you know, computer technology, uh, and so on is really big. And physics has played an important role in creating the World Wide Web in the first place. Um, maybe things that are, you know, in, uh, well, I hear in materials and manufacturing, those are classic areas where physics has been involved. Maybe it's not so clear that physics is involved in marketing and sales or finance. 
except that you may have heard of people being getting physics degrees and going to work at Wall Street. And then, of course, we think of physics as a major tool for exploration and for helping, you know, map out the future of humanity. So these are 24 different areas. And so my goal is to take the next 24 minutes um, and give you 24 challenges. And um, basically, the idea is you take any one of those application areas and um, you can pursue your own ideas for how to apply physics. Um, I'll try to give one general example, and then, um, uh, but it, there would be more uh, information available. I have a website that is, I hope, going to be eventually integrated into an SPS site. Uh, but, but the idea is that this organization that we're calling SciStar has uh, a subpart to it um, that's called Physics for Humans, and here's these 24 categories, and you can go and link to any one of those categories and find out more. Um, but coming back to the slide, um, I will then have a very specific challenge, which is really just meant, it's not necessarily something you need to try to undertake. It's just to sort of give you an idea. And in fact, I accidentally switched over to the first slide. So let me, let me just start. So here we go, one minute or so per slide. So energy, again, is an obvious area where physics is, is applied, and we've seen just this past winter how electric power grids can be vulnerable to disruption. So the uh, question is, how do we help ensure resilient and stable electric power grids? Um, they're marvelously complex systems. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of physics involved. And um, so one thing I, I sort of think about is, well, you know, we could be very traditional and look at how power grids are, are designed to be very stable. But it'd be fun to sort of make a crazy grid, uh, make a scale model power grid. Uh, you can take an alternator out of a car and you get three phase AC out of that alternator around 12 volts and then break all the rules. And I'm since I'm a chaos test, I would be interested in how do you make a grid that instead of being 60 cycles, very stable, what if we made it chaotic? What would be the nature of power transfer and would such a system be useful? because that could be a very robust system. I'm not advocating that this is the way we go. It's just something that uh, physicists could explore to see what, it, what we learn and then could any of that be useful. Um, air and water. So this, is, uh, this photo was taken like four days ago uh, in my front yard. You see um, the camper trailer uh, in uh, the, uh, that has its own self-contained uh, waste uh, collection system. And then you see a, a hole dug in our front yard and that's where they're actually preparing to, uh, uh, they're examining the soil for its suitability. We have to have our septic system replaced. Um, and so they're looking at the soil to see how suitable it is for that. So it has gotten me to think, well, what if we really go high tech on this? If we think about water treatment for Mars, uh, a Mars base or a moon base, can the technology that physics would develop for managing water and granular media and so on, can any of that lead to a new kind of design for rural communities? And you know, when you think about how we're experiencing big drought in uh, the Southwest right now, a mega drought, being able to better, better manage water is gonna be really critical, including waste treatment. Food, of course, is uh, essential to human survival. And it's an irony that in our, uh, very wealthy culture, we have urban food deserts. Uh, how do we um, make sure that food, uh, good nutritional quality food is available to uh, people in urban communities? And is there anything that physics can do about that? And I owe it to a physics student who really alerted me to the possibility that, um, uh, that uh, vertical farming is kind of an up and coming thing. And so is it possible for a group of physics students to get together and design a, a vertical farming system for a dorm and or some other kind of multi-resident dwelling? And the picture in the left actually is a plant growth chamber that we designed for some research on plants. And you'll notice the funny purple glow. Uh, that's what you get when you use optimal LED lighting, red and blue LEDs for sort of optimal uh, uh, growth illumination for uh, plants. Um, the next uh, category would be ecosystems, weather, and environment. 
again, this is on my property. This is our own little test forest for uh, experimenting with these crazy ideas that I have. And so we live in an area in Colorado where wildfire is a big deal. And we had the worst fires in the state's history uh, last year. And so uh, in terms of area of forest burned. So how do we manage the forest? And is there a way that we could use physics to help with that? And so I just put together this kind of really nutty idea. Well, could we make um, robotic forest critters? If you, if you look at how they manage forests, they have these huge machines that are amazing to watch, that they can uh, take down a tree and dice it up. But it's trouble, it's hard to get those machines in place. Um, and so is there some way that we could design um, swarm robotics to, to actually go in and, and help maintain forests rather than use uh, burns? Is that something that we could even consider? Um, moving on, um, dwellings and, and the built environment. We need houses. That's a human need, a place to have a roof over our heads. And so one of the problems that is uh, afflicting cities globally, and I've even read, even surprisingly, Denver, where I live and work, um, is problems with um, heating in urban landscapes. It Denver, we're fortunate that our climate doesn't give us too much excessive, uh, uncomfortable heat. But places like Chicago and, and other cities in the Northeast where you have you know, hot uh, weather and humidity, um, people die when uh, the, the temperature gets too warm and they don't live in build, buildings with adequate um, cooling. So is there a way that we can improve the heat transfer from uh, rooftops to, uh, to the surrounding atmosphere? Can we use local ambient energy to, to support the uh, flow? So I, I'm, I'm moving along here. Let me just sort of give everyone a, a moment to catch breath and, and just sort of reiterate what I'm doing with this is to um, give a sense that in each of these areas that are of vital importance to human well being we have a way to uh, think about how science and in particular physics intersects with these. And then we can brainstorm you know, solutions that, that could apply. And one of the things I really enjoy doing at the FizCon conferences is running a workshop where students do this brainstorming in real time. And I have to tell you, it's just a marvel to, to see what physics students come up with. Uh, across all these categories and, and think of uh, applications. So that again is the bigger picture. I'm gonna slide forward now and go through more of the topics. Um, things for daily, daily living, just the stuff we use every day or just kind of odd stuff like I show in this picture. It's a weird kind of clock that I found at a Goodwill store. Um, but the idea that you know, consumers buy things and how can physics help consumers make good decisions about the quality of stuff that they buy or even help the people that work in real retail stores um, make more informed uh, a discussion for consumers how, how to, to rate a good product. And uh, I've always enjoyed it when I've met people at some of the retail places um, who have sort of an interest in technology, the salespeople, and they can discuss intelligently and informatively um, how you rate these objects. And so physics can be a great resource for such, such things. But it's also fun to go to a, a, a thrift store like Goodwill or Salvation Army or others and just pick up things and say, okay, what's the physics involved there? And if I take it apart, what kind of physics can I learn and teach? And then can you take the things that you, you find in these and can you do a remix using physics to come up with something new? It's really great fun. I call it Goodwill Physics. Um, transportation, of course, uh, with things like the Hyperloop and uh, so on, uh, you know, uh, SpaceX uh, rockets, and uh, it's, of course, big time. Uh, Elon Musk has an undergraduate degree in, in physics. Um, and so we know that physics can do, you know, in the right hands, can do amazing stuff. And um, so I, I just thought, well, what's something, you know, aside from the really uh, amazing things like uh, that, that people are thinking about, electric cars and so on. What's something that could be important, but maybe uh, out of the, you know, sort of uh, out of the mainstream. And so, you know, delivering products is, is a, a major use of transportation technology. 
And I thought, well, could we deliver anything with a smart glider? Could we actually launch a glider from a drone and have it land something smoothly? It just be, really I think, kind of a fun challenge to see, okay, uh, can you accurately, how accurately can you drop a payload um, from a drop of, uh, at 30 meters high? And so I just pose that as a challenge. Um, maintenance, recycling, disposal. Well, you see the infamous plastics, uh, plastic bottles in the bucket to the left. And I have to say that one of the consequences of living in the pandemic is that I've become very non-sustainable in, in my desire to have soft drinks and uh, consuming all these uh, you know, plastic bottles, whereas usually I don't do that. I try to buy things out of uh, fountains and use reusable cups. But uh, the question is, well, what can we do with all this plastic? And so I um, have this thing that I've called the solar pet project. The type of plastic in these bottles is called polyethylene terephthalate or PET. And uh, it turns out you can chip this up and, and um, melt it and extrude, extrude it and create polyester fiber. So is there a way that you can create the kind of sweater that I'm wearing right now um, in a local solar driven plant? Is that possible? Um, family, friends, and community. Now we're getting in territory where you may not think of physics being directly applicable. Um, this sounds more like sociology. But when you think about it, you know, especially in the pandemic, people were isolated and there was not physical contact. Well, physical is the word. And so I'm just curious. Is, there, is it even meaningful to have some way of transmitting over a distance the wonderful feeling of someone that touches us? Is it crazy? Is it, you know, can we possibly extend that sort of warm feeling? Um, but uh, I just sort of took this picture for fun of my little mannequin here touching my arm. And would it be nice, you know, if, if, if um, I'm off traveling and, and uh, you know, I, I could uh, touch somebody this way? Um, or if somebody's away on the moon, and this could happen. Health, of course, is a major application of physics and science. Um, the immune system has, of course, been a huge deal with the pandemic. And um, it's uh, in my field of research, we've looked at modeling of the health and the immune response. So is there a way that we could create nanotechnologies to identify and monitor biomarkers, molecules like the one that I show is a kind of biomolecule called a cytokine that's been really instrumental and in, in maybe a problem with the, the response to COVID-19. And then you get this excessive immune response. So if we could monitor this, maybe we could intervene sooner and, and uh, help prevent the worst of the, the reaction to the disease. But it's gonna take uh, some time to figure out how we could actually get adequate data in a really important and difficult area of trying to apply physics. Education, of course, um, we all think about how we could improve uh, physics education. Um, lots of great ideas out there. Since I teach lab courses and I was involved with colleagues in the uh, American Association of Physics Teachers about how do we make sure that lab courses are accessible to everyone, including people with various um, uh, impairments to their, their abilities, uh, if they've lost their sight or use of their hands. This is a wonderful apparatus that we developed for measuring the tensile strength of wire. And it's, it's operated by hand, so you can get a feel for how strong the wire is. How could someone who's blind or someone who doesn't have the use of their hands actually get this equivalent experience. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for physics students to collaborate and maybe to collaborate with someone who especially does, can inform the whole group about how uh, you know, their, their different abilities, it, looking at it from their point of view, could actually make a better experience for everyone. I think it's just a marvelous opportunity. Um, safety is an important aspect of uh, our lives. And I mentioned wildfires being a key aspect of uh, the reality of our living in Colorado. And so are there ways that we could develop instrumentation to distribute through a community so the community can be more resilient and better prepared uh, and, and respond more quickly and accurately to a, a hazard in real time? 
And so I'm interested in wireless sensor networks and how can we take the sensor system that I show in the picture to the left and maybe uh, uh, deliver it into you know, parts of the neighborhood, uh, perhaps with my glider delivery system and uh, then have a network so that we could uh, have real time situation report about the state of things in, in, in the neighborhood and, and, and respond correctly if there's a hazard. Um, information and communication, of course, quantum computing would probably leap to mind right away as an area where physics has now got some major role. And a lot of our students are interested in, in now in quantum computing, and that's great. So I decided to just sort of think of another aspect of this. And we've gotten so enthralled with digital technology, uh, it, it's sort of one of my pet peeves is that the word technology now is used in popular speak to refer just to digital technology. And there's so much of other technology. So I think it'd be great if we sort of re, uh, reunited ourselves with other things. And I have a little play on the, the idea that you've probably heard of the game, maybe called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you see how many uh, steps away of actors it takes to, to, you know, from some film you've seen to something that's involved Ke Kevin Bacon. So I played on that with the idea of six degrees of cooking bacon. How do we put in back into our mind? And here I have a Da Vinci sketch um, uh, of a human head. How do we get back, uh, reconnect using computer technology, but how do we reconnect the reality of our existence? Um, there's nothing more real than the, the smell of cooking bacon, or since uh, my wife and I are uh, a vegetarian, uh, some protein, uh, plant-based protein substitute, how do we keep ourselves really uh, connected with the physical aspects? I think that's an important part of uh, physics and information. Art, craft, and hobbies uh, and entertainment. Uh, Michaela has just told me that she has uh, enjoyed art and uh, I have enjoyed working with artists. And um, I think art and science work really well together. This picture on the left is a drawing by the uh, famous scientist Ramon y Cajal. Um, you know, 200, 120 years ago of the structure of the nervous system. And it really gives some sense of what's going on in um, abstracting uh, what the ner nervous system looks like. What if we made a dynamical view of that, that, that operated in real time? Could it help people who either suffered from a disease or were caring for people with disease to um, better uh, deal with neurological disorders like tremor or uh, pain? Um, sports and recreation. I initially had a picture of someone playing volleyball, and then I drew over that with my own robotic thing. Um, maybe you've seen this wonderful video of the uh, Boston Dynamics uh, um, robots doing a dance. Well, this is inspired somewhat by that. So what if we made uh, either a rob robot or even a uh, mannequin that was jointed? Could Manipulating this thing help us understand the kinematics and forces. And, and I think the problem to solve here is um, how do people who are beginning in, in, in a sport acquire motor skills and can physics uh, help with that in some way? Um, there's a new commercial from Nike that emphasizes people doing, you know, at the beginning of, of um, sports that I really love because it shows people just messing up big time but keeping and trying. And I think if we could help with that process of mastering skills uh, using physics in some way, it'd be really great. Um, hospitality and personal services. I, I, I don't know if when you go and get your haircut, you think about applications of physics to uh, what's going on. Um, and of course, during the past 18 months, maybe you've not, well, maybe you've had to cut your own hair. And so you have thought about it. Um, these are some shears that my wife and I have been using. But we actually were invited years ago by someone running a hairdressing shop to actually go and look at their operations because the problem that they were having was repetitive motion disorder, uh, things like carpal tunnel syndrome or some variant of that. And so are there ways that we could design um, tools that would still give the, the, uh, the craft of the, uh, of the human service, the wonderful human to human connection, and yet uh, help people who are providing that service avoid injury and better do their jobs. And so I think it'd be fun to see if there are ways to, to make new tools.
materials production, now we're getting into a few categories where physics plays a huge role and a lot of physicists are employed. So material science, materials physics is a major uh, area. Um, people I've worked with have been studying the science of granular materials. And so, um, so uh, Keegan actually will recognize this since he's been involved in this project. Uh, he's one of the people tuned into our discussion today. And we're interested in knowing how could we use um, vortex flow to, to manipulate particles. And I'm not giving any treat away any trade secrets of the work that Keegan's been doing, because basically here is the uh, basis of the Dyson vacuum cleaner. But is there a way we could use this kind of device to, to do materials processing? Um, manufacturing, again, is an area that is um, uh, key to physics, uh, I mean, employment. Uh, and now with 3D printers and uh, so-called additive manufacturing, also laser etchers um, and laser uh, vaporization, the, I think a big challenge is how do we now take all of that wonderful controllable technology and merge it all together so you can make a whole product. So you can mix electronics and optics and fluidics and so on into a single project. And this ink, inkjet cartridge maybe is a good example of how you would unify these sort of, sorts of things um, if you could make them all together in one system. So I think it's a really interesting problem of how could physics be used to make, uh, make such kind of, um, you know, it, this, this could open up sort of local manufacturing in, in a really nice way where objects could be created on demand. Uh, technical supplies, technical services. This is a big area where physics is involved. Um, and we design technical equipment of all sorts. In fact, uh, if probably this is the major area where physics gets applied in industry. How do we make vacuum systems and optical systems and lasers and so on? But I, I've posed the, 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 problem, the, the, the task of how do we make these technologies available to inventors and communities and small businesses at really low cost or even free. And um, so I have this thing that I call the Technitrove, which would be a public library of technical things. So imagine going to a library, but instead of checking out books, uh, you'll see in this picture uh, that we've got a Wimshurst machine and a Tesla coil and, and uh, other apparatus. Um, and uh, we actually had something like this set up for a while uh, next to a high school. And that's what this is a picture from that my wife took. And so we had stored these devices that could be pulled off the shelf when somebody wanted to invent something. Okay, again, now we're getting into an area where you don't think so much about physics, about mar marketing and sales, good grief. Did you go into physics so you could become a marketing expert? Well, um, I mean, one of the things is that we do move products to the people that buy them. That's what marketing and sales is about. And along the way, the products get damaged. So is there a way that we could put smart devices in, in the packaging so that you could tell if a product is likely to have been damaged so that that could be flagged ahead of time and uh, make sure that the product was properly inspected? Um, and you can see the, the dishware from our kitchen. Yours truly does the dishwashing so, and sometimes and, and uh, the, the, the items are the, the worst for wear. Um, so is there a way to make sensor systems to detect this? Okay, um, you may not know why I've got a picture of a guy in a bathtub in, in, in a slide about finance until you look up at the little text that says Archimedes ha ha moment. In the lower right, you'll see a crown. And this was Archimedes Eureka moment where he realized he had a way of distinguishing a, a crown made from gold uh, as opposed to a counterfeit crown. Well, imagine now applying that concept to other kinds of valuation. And in particular, uh, evaluating a home where a lot of the quality of a home is really literally buried in the walls. So can um, uh, physics be useful, especially as homes become so much more costly? Can physics be useful in, in properly evaluating a home um, so that you really have a solid basis for its value? Okay, just uh, uh, three more now. Uh, and so Again, management, administration, legal services. You might think, gosh, physics, what does it have to do with that? Well, it was a physicist who invented the copying machine. 
Chester Carlson invented the photocopier and he thought of it while he was working as an intern in a law firm. And so, uh, yes, physics, of course, can help in this. And we certainly know from this past year, knowing how to authenticate documents like ballots is really important. And so are there ways that we could embed real time, maybe a modifiable authentication system that help us realize that, yes, this document really did come from a person and therefore, you know, make it much more, dem you know, viable to have truly democratic systems of voting and, and reliable systems of issuing licenses and so, and so on. Okay, now finally, the last two, I think will make more sense in terms of how physics really gets involved, um, you know, exploration. But just a very few people get to be the explorers that go into space. Um, uh, I guess Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos is trying to help some people get into space as space tourists but it's still going to be the case that very few people get to go into the frontiers of exploration. And yet some of the frontiers of exploration are right under our nose. This picture is an infrared photograph of my home stereo system. And so it'd be fun to use physics to, to just set up your own, what I call society of explorers of the familiar and engage people to, uh, to you know, rediscover what's around them. Um, and finally, future humans. Um, I think of future human, humans in two ways. One is humans like us who are living in the future and we need to be mindful of their well-being now so that we don't mess things up, that we actually make a better planet for future hum humans like my grandchildren to inhabit. Um, but it's also a, a meaning of, well, how are humans going to be adapted to the future? And uh, here's an example of what we're doing right now that's sort of sort of obvious. I mean, you know, these wearable glasses and these uh, wearable uh, uh, noise canceling headphones. And so I thought it'd be fun to, you know, one challenge would be to make a display of what are we doing right now? It really already enhances human abilities without getting into, you know, deep ethical issues of like genetic modification. What are just some of the things that we do that are acceptable that already have a profound effect on, on what people can do? So those are the categories, and now uh, where next? So um, there's uh, this organization that um, that I call uh, SciStar, and, um, and um, it, it's uh, I'm going to click over momentarily to the website that is at the Society of Physics Students now under Programs and Resources, Outreach, um, and then Entrepreneurship Outreach. You get to this slide, and um, my hope is that. Uh, some of you might be interested in wherever you are uh, working or living or going to school, um, forming a local chapter under, you know, under the auspices of Sci uh, Society of Physics Students of uh, SciStar. SciStar stands for Physics Student Innovators, and the star then means and alumni. And so uh, this would be the idea is to form an organization that help, could help you and others do the kind of innovation projects that, that I was just describing. And so that could be a next possibility. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is that in order to do these, uh, these projects, physics is a great start, but then you need to augment the physics with um, a, a select group of technical competencies. You may need to learn how to do electronics, almost certainly. You may need to know, know how to do vacuum systems. Um, maybe you'll have to do something more exotic, like you know, using nuclear instrumentation. Maybe you'll get into biophysics, like I mentioned, and then you have to learn about molecular biology methods. So I've uh, listed these technical competencies and, and uh, one of the big projects now um, affiliated with SciStar is to uh, get students interested in, in learning and, and enabling others to learn these competencies. And uh, we're making a, you'll notice that there are 52 of these. And so we're making a deck of cards that's gonna you know, uh, sort of get the idea across that there's one for each of these competencies. And then the question is, you know, what's, what's in your deck? What are you playing with when you try to solve these problems? In conclusion then, I think the idea as a physicist is that we get to pursue the physics that intrigues us. But now what I'm advocating is that you also consider applying physics to some area of human well-being. And this picture to the left is actually a picture from my cousin's farm 
he's an engineer. Uh, Mark Betridge is an engineer, but he got very interested in, in, in growing nutritious food for his community. So he and his family have set up this farm and this is a greenhouse for growing microgreens. And he kindly gave me permission to use this picture. And so the, the thing you do is, is when you wanna do something like this, then you acquire the technical competencies you need to augment the physics you know. And whether you create something like this that can serve a whole community, or you create something that serves just one person that you know who could really use some kind of assistive device or some kind of tool that they, they need in their business, you make the world a better place. And so that's, uh, that's been uh, the goal of giving this talk is to inspire you to, to think of doing this and, and sponsoring others, helping others do it. So thank you very much, that's, that's the talk. Thank you so much, Randy, that was wonderful. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and while we wait for people to type, I had a question for you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so as a physics professor, how have you, like, have you been able to encourage students to go into these lesser known fields or like, how would you encourage students to go into these lesser known Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, I, um, uh, one uh, nice success story is um, uh, I met with a freshman years ago in 2012 who uh, was interested in majoring in biophysics. And we started talking about his life experiences. And I learned that he had lost uh, a mentor on, uh, out on a, um, a hiking um, excursion because this uh, mentor was, uh, um, suffered a heart attack. And they brought in a rescue helicopter and the rescue helicopter couldn't extract this person um, uh, in time to take them to, to hospital care. So this student, uh, while he was an undergraduate and then after he graduated, really took this and, and, and took, you know, the, an, with, along with another physics major and later with some engineering students, um, uh, designed a system for stabilizing the, uh, the uh, cable that goes down from a rescue helicopter. So they've now set up a company that, that actually does that. And it's a very successful company that, that, that stabilizes these rescue systems. So that's a really nice example of how something has really come about. But more generally, um, I've worked both with high school students um, at one extreme and, the, uh, and then at the other extreme, I set up something called the Community Prototyping Lab, where for a while we were having physics students work as consultants for small businesses to explore, you know, like one example was a, a couple my age um, uh, that was approaching retirement and they wanted to do something beneficial. And they had the idea that people outside to avoid getting skin cancer should have some convenient way of covering their heads other than a hat. And so they wanted to develop a hands-free kind of parasol. And so we brainstormed that and uh, we came up, a uh, student developed a prototype and uh, when I was in Boston for a conference one year, I saw um, a display that says that said as seen on Shark Tank, and I saw something that looked really close to the prototype that the student had developed. I don't know if it was a direct lineage of that. Um, I think it was sort of a convergence of thinking, but it's just that we were able to get students in contact with small businesses and do this kind of stuff. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say about the program? Um, well, I hope that, uh, you know, we'll have a chance to extend this further at uh, FizzCon in 2022. We'll have another workshop on uh, uh, brainstorming these things. So there will be a chance to, uh, what we do in that workshop is actually, is I think, Michaela, you were involved in the logistics of helping to set that up. So you know that, that that's a lot of paper and scissors and so on for uh, making prototypes. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, you can look forward to that. And uh, the, the website that, that SBS is now setting up for SciStar has some ideas about uh, um, and links to help you know, bring it local. Um, uh, my, uh, one of the other inspirations I should mention for this project is, is a colleague who works at the American Institute of Physics, uh, Philip Bohammer. And he had a program that he called Taking Physics Local. And it's just this idea 
of how do we take physics and have it impact the local community. So I just would encourage people to think about that. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, but I did want to say thank you again, not only for giving this talk, but for all the work you've put into SPS um, over the years. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you all for joining in.